conservation of momentum. So the idea is that, um, the big idea is that an impulse, which is the force times the time that it acts, this impulse is equal to the change in momentum. And so if you know the impulse, you know the force and the time it acts, or you can find um, this, then you know the change in momentum. So a quick word about how we use words in physics. Objects are considered uh, entities which have no um, mass, or I'm sorry, no uh, size that matters. So they're just sort of point objects or nearly point objects, and all their mass can be treated as if it's located at one place. And um, in this case, we have two objects. We call them cars. And then a system is a collection of objects which are somehow interacting or related or connected. So for example, the solar system is um, all of the objects which are connected to the sun, which are interacting with the sun in some way and orbiting it. So um, we're going to look at systems in this lesson. So what I want you to do is think about this, uh, this car here. So there's a blue car sitting still, and an arrow flies to the right, and it smacks into the blue car, and the two of them move off. So we're going to consider the arrow an object, we're going to consider the blue car an object, and there's definitely a force on each. So there is a force on the blue car due to the arrow. The arrow pushes on the blue car to the right. At the same time, the blue car pushes on the arrow to the left, and it causes the arrow to slow down. But what we care about is the system. So the blue car and the arrow together form a system. And the forces that the blue car and the arrow exert on each other are internal forces in that system. They are not external forces on that system. And so that's what we care about. So if there's no external force on a system, then the impulse on the system is zero. That's the big idea. If the impulse on a system is zero, then the momentum change is zero. And of course, if the change in momentum is zero, that implies that for the system, the final momentum is the same as the initial momentum. So that looks something like this, symbolically. If there's no external force on a system, then the change in momentum of the system is zero, and the final momentum equals the initial momentum. So this is the conservation of momentum. Now, it's important to realize we are applying this to a system. Does the momentum of the blue car change during the collision? Yes, absolutely. It was sitting still, and now it's moving. So the blue car gained momentum. Does the momentum of the red arrow change during the collision? Yes, absolutely. It had a lot of momentum, it smacked into the blue car, and now it has less momentum. But it is the total momentum of the system that is conserved. So the momentum of the arrow plus the momentum of the blue car together are conserved. So the arrow loses some momentum, the blue car gains that momentum, but the total momentum before and after the collision is the same. It is conserved. That's the idea. Okay, the same thing happens um, if there's no external force, like for example, between these two cars, there's an explosion that pushes them apart. The explosion pushes on the two cars to the right and to the left, but there's no external forces. So momentum is conserved in this case too, and we'll take a look at that in an example problem. So explosions, collisions, they're really all the same thing. If you run an explosion movie backwards, it's a collision. A collision movie backwards is an explosion. There are two types of collisions that you need to know about. The first one is um, an elastic collision. So let me skip ahead here. An elastic collision is a, is a collision where kinetic energy is conserved. So think if you had a super ball, an elastic ball that was perfect. If you dropped it from one meter high, it would bounce back to one meter high. So no energy would be lost during the collision. And that's an elastic collision. And of course, if it's not elastic, then it's inelastic. IN is the, metri is the uh, Latin prefix we use to mean negate, right? So inelastic, inactive, involuntary, these all mean not, right? So, so either a collision is elastic and energy is conserved, or it's inelastic and energy is not conserved. Now, there's a special case of inelastic when things hit and stick together, and that's called completely inelastic. So sometimes we talk about completely inelastic collisions. Um, we're going to do a lab. Um, we aren't able to do it because I'm out and it's pretty complicated, but we'll do this lab when I get back. But we're going to arrange a whole bunch of collision types and then check and see whether they're elastic or inelastic and whether momentum is conserved. But the, the sort of the spoiler alert is that it turns out that momentum is always conserved. So it doesn't matter what kind of collision it is. Elastic collisions are fairly rare, um, at least in our everyday lives. Uh, collisions between um, 
Molecules, um, like an ideal gas, tend to be elastic. Magnetic interactions, gravitational interactions are all elastic. And then uh, anytime you have deformation, an object gets bent or twisted or crushed in any way, you lose energy, and that's an inelastic collision. And then completely inelastic is when they hit and stick. And the important thing here is that although energy is conserved for elastic collisions, it's not in any other collision. But it doesn't matter what kind of collision it is, momentum is always conserved. So we're going to use this idea of conservation momentum to solve problems. So let me solve a couple of example problems. They'll go pretty quick, and then you guys are going to work on some problem sets yourself to uh, apply this. So imagine you have a girl standing on a frictionless skateboard. Um, she's holding a pumpkin. She throws the pumpkin to the right at 4 meters per second. We want to know what happens to her after she throws the pumpkin. It always helps to have a diagram of what's going on before and after. And it helps to draw the velocity. So the pumpkin's moving to the right. The girl is going to move to the left. And we are going to expect that her velocity, her final velocity, is negative. We need to keep track of what's going on. So we need a bunch of variables. Since we're dealing with momentum, we need masses and velocities. We're going to need some subscripts, though. We have the mass of the girl and the mass of the pumpkin here. <coughs> Excuse me. We have velocity of the pumpkin initial, before she throws it, and the velocity of the pumpkin final, after she throws it. And then we're going to have the velocity of the girl initial, before she throws it, and the velocity of the girl final. Now, since there's no external forces acting on this, I mean, gravity's pulling down on the girl, but the normal force of the ground is pushing up on her, and those cancel. And we're ignoring the force of gravity on the pumpkin. So the pumpkin will fall in the y direction, but there's no net forces in the x direction. So that's kind of what we're looking at. There's no external forces that we need to worry about. Um, we know the mass of the girl and the pumpkin. We also know that the pumpkin is not moving initially. And we also know that the pumpkin, after it's thrown, is moving to the right at 4 meters per second. We know the girl is not moving initially, so there's no initial velocity for the girl either. And we're trying to find the final velocity of the pumpkin. So... This is the big idea. We're going to apply the impulse momentum theorem to the system. It is important that you note that when you start the problem. Okay? If you apply the impulse momentum theorem to the pumpkin, there is a force on the pumpkin that's outside of the pumpkin. It's the girl pushing on it, and the momentum of the pumpkin will change. But we're going to apply this to the entire system, which is the girl and the pumpkin. Since there are no external forces on the system, then the change in momentum is zero. And if the change of momentum is zero, that implies that the initial and the final momentum are the same. So we need to write out an expression for the final momentum. So the final momentum will be the mass of the girl times the velocity of the girl final. This is the final momentum of the girl. Plus the final momentum of the pumpkin. That's got to equal the initial momentum, which is the mass of the girl times the velocity of the girl initial plus the mass of the pumpkin times the velocity of the pumpkin initial. So this is our big equation we get when we apply this principle of energy, I'm sorry, momentum conservation. Our plan, of course, is to solve that for the velocity of the girl final. We're going to do it algebraically because we want to find an expression. And so we clobber things that are zero. That's what's left. We rearrange by bringing this term here to the other side of the equation and then divide both sides by the mass of the girl and you have an algebraic expression. Plug in your numbers and you get an answer. And it makes sense. It's negative. It's moving to the left. And she's not moving as fast as the pumpkin because she's heavier than the pumpkin. So that's kind of how we apply this principle to solve the problems, okay? Here's two more. Um, I'll go pretty quick here. We have a teal car of uh, mass 0.36 kilograms. It's moving to the right, and it crashes into a gray car, which is sitting still. The two of them stick together. That's what it means by saying the collision is completely inelastic. And they're joined together as they move off. So our variable list is going to look like this. We know the masses of the gray and the teal car. Since they are moving together after the collision, we do not need separate final velocities. We don't need the final velocity of the gray car and the final velocity of the teal car. They're stuck together, so we just have one final velocity. Now, of course, the gray car was not moving initially, so its initial velocity is zero, and the teal car was moving to the right. So the same idea. Because there is no external force, momentum change is zero. If the change in momentum is zero, that means that momentum is conserved. The final equals the initial. We write out expressions for the final momentum. So this is the mass of the teal car times the velocity final plus the mass of the green times the velocity final. And that's got to equal the initial momentum. Since the gray car was not moving, the initial momentum of the gray car is zero. So the only momentum we had before the collision was in the uh, teal car. 
since we're trying to find the final velocity, we can factor it out of the left-hand side here. It looks like this. If you're not sure if that's right, try distributing. This times this, whoops. The this times that gives you this expression. And then this times this gives you this expression. So it worked. And then solve for the final velocity by dividing both sides by this expression. And then plug in your numbers and you'll get your answer. Okay. So uh, one third example, I'll leave it to you to pause the video and kind of look at it, but some, some um, hints to go along with this. It helps make a diagram before and after the interaction, and it helps to show the velocity on the um, diagram as arrows. <coughs> you really need to make sure you get the velocity on the, uh, the directions of the velocity right. You're going to get the problem wrong, and it's going to be frustrating if you get the velocity directions wrong. Please choose subscripts that are meaningful for the problem and label your diagram so the reader knows what subscripts you're using. And then work carefully. These are problems that aren't very hard, but they're tedious and you make lots of mistakes. So the last problem I want you to take a peek at is um, a basketball. It's moving to the right. It crashes into a tennis ball that's moving to the left. And after the collision, the basketball is moving to the right still, not as fast. It goes from five meters per second to two meters per second, and the tennis ball goes zooming off, and we gotta find the final velocity of the tennis ball. So here's my variable list. Note that I use T for tennis ball and B for basketball. And the initial velocity of the tennis ball is negative. It's moving to the left initially. You gotta make sure you got that part right. There are no external forces during the collision, so momentum is conserved, so P final equals P initial. We write out an expression for what that means. We're solving it for the velocity of the tennis ball final, which we isolate, it's this big mess. Plug in your numbers and it turns out to be 18 meters per second, okay? So you're going to solve a problem set today to practice applying this idea of conservation of momentum. So there's three examples um, to give you kind of an idea of how it's all going to look, okay? So take a crack at it, work together, help each other, um, and uh, if you have any questions, you can email me. I might be up to be able to answer questions, okay? <laughs>